Hello, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Starting off with a look at Euro Pound. Talked about it reaching targets above 87 and the 200 day is containing it. I was shorting it up at uh, this 8740 level. Um, I think it's going to pull back to, Steve was talking something about 85 and a half, 85. I think you have to buy this pullback because the next wave could take us up to 91. If you're a dollar bear, this is a good sign, even though we're getting a pullback in Euro as well. Okay, from I think an important trend line that Blake showed yesterday. Anyway, I'm staying focused on Euro pound. We'll be looking to buy pullbacks. This was, I'm going to call it about a four and a half, 450 pip move here. So, you know, to look for 85 would be normal. And the next move could be 700 pips. That could take us all the way back towards this 91 level, 90, 91. Actually think that before it's all over with the dollar, we'll be taking out these 93 highs. That's my view. Uh, we had a nice pop in the metals yesterday, but again, silver underperforming gold. Actually gold looks like it has a chance for new highs here. Wouldn't take much for us to get new highs. Whereas if we get new highs in gold, and silver rallies in sympathy, the 1780 level is going to be a sell zone for me. Hello, Inger. Sinatra, Shahab, how are you? Uh, looking at S&Ps, I want to tip my hat to my partner, Steve Volge, who yesterday live on face said he would view any interest rate cut by the Fed as a shorting opportunity. Here was the Fed cut of 50 basis points. Uh, one of the best day trades, knowing Steve probably position traded it or took part of it off. Uh, a couple of things I could see the potential if we're gonna hold here for this to be maybe A, B, C, up towards uh, 3,200. From here, this would actually take it up to, you know, 3250. Back under these lows today, we have problems. Yen's trying to bottom here. Have a decent little reversal day off a of three drive. There you go. One, two, three. I'm not convinced, um, even though you're going to see we were talking about interest rates and the bonds yesterday, and someone was talking about a bottom. Uh, thought it was premature and it was premature with the interest rate cut. We got all the way down to 90. We are diverging here. So it is a possibility that we're going to have a, a, a nice little pop in yields from here. Uh, same thing happened in TLT. Huge up day, huge spike, but still closed higher. If the yen isn't bottoming here, and I still think there's a chance it isn't, just like the end could fail from these levels one more time. On a shorter term, you had a three drive, but on a four hour, it looks like a one. Just count this whole thing as a one, and then count this as two, and one more drive, and this is what I'm looking for, is a push down towards this 106.12 level. So. Uh, that would most likely entail that we failed from here at this 3080 level, which again, the throwover line uh, was respected on this candle. Got through it on the Fed cut, but couldn't close above it. So 3100, 3090, still a pretty good uh, resistance level. We'd have to close over it to get the next scenario for 3200 or better. And I think that's about all I'm gonna cover here for now. Let's see what else, was there anything I wanted to talk about? Could get a, a recovery uh, in the US dollar back to about 98.40. Um, that's where I think would be a natural place. And 
by then probably be looking at euro pound uh, once again. And uh, that's it. I think we have coverage on that. Would love to see 1780 silver to get short. I mean, you had a two and a half dollar break. Uh, if we have two and a half from here, it's going to give you 1530 if it's a quality. And if it's 1.618, a short from up here it could take us all the way down to $14 silver. So looking for this, would love to see one more high in gold for a third drive. I know some people are talking 1800. I think a guy from JP Morgan was talking that if gold does make a new high for the first time, even though it didn't confirm, maybe it's going to stay under 70 up here. So um, we'll see what happens. I want to uh, recommend that people invest in themselves by at least trying us for 10 days and being able to have all this research at your fingertips. Okay, so you have all these different looks here. Here's a weekly on the euro. So, Italy, uh, this coronavirus is uh, for real. And I actually read a, an article by some scientists that they're really, it's going to be very difficult to make a, a vaccine with the coronavirus. It isn't easy to make a vaccine. So, um, you know, this is going to be something we're going to be talking about longer than we talked about Brexit or the same amount of time anyway. So with that being said, Blake, how are you today? And uh, I know you're enjoying this action that we're getting in the market. Yeah, and you know, I am. And uh, good morning, Dale. Good Actually, morning, buddy. You know, the, the, what, I'm, what I think is happening today is we sure. are seeing a, uh, a consolidation of, uh, of all this volatility and it's probably gonna be pretty choppy. I I'm thinking, I'm thinking probably into the end of the week until we get an on-farm payroll. Remember today we yeah, have, uh, yeah. what's that? Oh yeah, I keep thinking Friday's tomorrow. No, today's only Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish, I wish it was Friday, holy cow. Yeah. Uh, but we do have ADP coming up here in just a few minutes, which we'll, we'll have to take a look at. But this is the S&P. I just want to show you guys what we're dealing with. This is um, uh, what I feel, you can see, I've got it trapped by two trend lines. Um, like because that. I think we're actually range bound right now. Uh, one of the things that we do have to be a little careful of uh, today is the ADP numbers, because one thing that's kept the U.S. economy strong is our just very consistent job numbers, strength in our jobs market. We, we're, it's not like we're you know you you can you can argue the quality of jobs may be for crap. Uh, oh crap! Speaking of crap, um, euro is getting a little bit of a boost here. It's a little risk off move. I'll talk about the euro here in a second. Um, the uh, the the jobs market here in the U U.S. has been really strong, very stable. Like I said, you can argue the the quality of jobs. You can say, well, it's just crappy jobs, but it doesn't matter. People are working, and that's one of the things that's kept the U.S. economy afloat. So we'll be watching that. Geez, what the hell is happening with the S and P's here? Um, uh, Switzerland numbers jumping. Uh, you know, some I think some of these fears in the coronavirus is uh, you know you got Italian schools that are all closing right now, Italian universities and schools, and and that's going to come to the United States probably realistically. You know, I uh, here in the here in Maricopa County, I live in Arizona in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we got our first uh, coronavirus case. Uh, you 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 knock that number up to about five, and I'm pretty sure that our schools will end up closing too. So, you know, it's not like people won't work. Um, people will be working from home, uh, you know, but, but productivity will end up slowing down if that's, you know, uh, but, uh, and I'm using, I, I use Arizona as more of a uh, exaggerated case because we, we, you know, it, 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 we give a, we get a couple droplets of rain here and then people drive, you know, 48 miles per hour below the speed limit because they don't know how to do it. You know, so Arizona kind of an extreme case, and it really doesn't even matter because we don't have a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, companies here. But it, but you know, you you take the companies like you know out of uh, San Francisco or Los Angeles, and you know you start closing those schools and universities, then it it prevents you know half of your workers from going to work. 
um, because you got you know it's a lot of a lot of parents are are home with their kids and they can't go into work so they have you know so it, it will slow down productivity those are the things that we we've got to kind of keep in mind moving forward because uh, we're already starting to see it in you know like I said the world it, this is I, I I still view that the coronavirus is not a long term issue but it is a you know first couple of quarters. How's it going to impact global growth? How's it going to impact GDP here? How's it going to impact job job creation? Um, I, I think it could tip us into a recession. It's you know we 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 we've been in a, a very long period of expansion, and this is a very very good excuse for us to probably you know have some sort of recessionary type of um, uh, action in the economy, you know, uh, real estate transactions are probably going to slow down. A lot of business transactions are going to slow down. My wife, uh, she has a, a gifting company. All of her suppliers have basically uh, stopped supplying. Um, so, you know, and, 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 and on top of that, people aren't buying because now she has the ones that have product are calling her, uh, you know, saying, Hey, do you want to want to buy this or buy that? And she's like, um, my sales have slowed, so you know, no. So there's there's a lot of a uh, lot of implications, but um, that that's neither here nor there. What we're dealing with right now is the S and P. You can see it's really I, I feel consolidating. So above one uh, above thirty one hundred is bullish, below uh, thirty twenty is bearish. You know the markets are up overnight because now people don't understand, especially if you're in Europe, why stocks are higher with Joe Biden. Um, you know. Uh, commanding last night in the Democratic primaries. The, I, I'm going to make it real simple. Bernie Sanders has a a following very similar to one of Donald Trump's. He's got a rabid following of people. He is the only person that would be a threat to Donald Trump's presidency. The market knows that Joe Biden has no shot. He doesn't. And I, 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 I actually believe that too. Uh, and I'm not a Biden or, or Bernie fan. Uh, I'm just, I'm just telling you guys how it is. Um, that's why stocks were higher overnight because they're like, well, you know, Biden's going to be the nominee, so he's not going to be able to beat Trump. Uh, he's, you know, uh, pretty delusional. Have you guys heard him speak? I mean, it's, it's like fingernails on a cross, you know, on a chalkboard anyway. Um, actually they both are, but anyway, I, I, I have to say that the, 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 the one reason why stocks were rallying overnight is because of that. Now, um, can he, can Biden beat Trump? Maybe, you know, we'll see. Um, uh, you know, I doubt it honestly, but, uh, but anyway, th those are things that we're going to be paying attention to, uh, moving forward, but that's, but stocks are now a little lower as the you know, coronavirus is kind of setting in and you got North American traders stepping in, you know, selling into this rally that we saw yesterday when the Fed, Fed uh, delivered that the big, um, you know, rate cut, stock still fell. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, let me pull up the euro really quick before we go into the dollar index and we go into the, uh, the data here in a second. The euro is trapped. Uh, it is trapped by the 200-day moving average right here. And the breakout point and this big channel resistance. I'm going to tell you guys, while we're above 111 and below 112, there's nothing to do. Below 111 is bearish. Above 112, you know, especially if we get close above, I know we traveled up there yesterday, but we need to really close above 112, then it's bullish. We are trapped in this area, and so you just be really, really careful as we head into the data. And I think this is a consolidation area that's going to yield us breakout, breakout, or breakdown. So, um, and when, when you're, when you've got risk off, meaning if stocks, let's, let's just, you know, um, entertain me really quick. Oh crap. We're hold on ADP data in just a few seconds. Uh, let's go to the dollar index. Let me pull up my Bloomberg. Uh, we'll, let's just pay attention. ADP is looking for 170. You'll see it here. You guys also have um, your, uh, your uh, 183. Okay, so not not bad, not bad. Still hanging in there. ADP is not as bad as it could have been. So, all right, it's not going to really move the market at all. 
I think maybe people might have thought it was going to be worse, and so it might get a little bit of a dollar bounce. But I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not. I, I don't think it's going to move the needle too much. Uh, um, we do have. Uh, let's let's go over to a quick uh, data flash. And what you'll see today is we just had uh, we, we just had the ADP numbers, and so that's. Hold on, really quick. Check something. We have ISM. Oh, we have, we, we yeah. have the Bank of Canada a little bit later too. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. and, and ISM, uh, ISM, and we do have the Bank of Canada today, which is going to be a big, big deal. Uh, good morning, there, Stelios. Good morning, bro. How are you doing? How's, How's it going? Good, good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the dollar Canadian. So we do have the Bank of Canada, and, and look, I'm I'm going to tell you guys right now, I don't know how to trade this uh, this data. Um, the Bank of Canada, if you look at, hold on, let me pull up Bloomberg really quick. This is uh, um, this is the uh, Bank of Canada rate decision, and um, today. Well, now it's it's changed to um, uh, 0.395. So it, uh, the market split uh, between, you know, it, it, I mean, we're we're obviously looking at there's 158 percent chance that we get a cut. So the question will be, do we get a quarter or do we get a half point cut? And uh, the way the market has responded, we saw the Aussie rally as the RBA only delivered a quarter basis point cut. Uh, we saw the dollar um, yesterday sell off after delivering, you know, a, a, a half a basis point cut. So, I mean, I, I think what we have to do with the Canadian is just respect technicals and kind of wait for it to, you know, wait for the data to be released. Uh, let, let me point out specifics. Your so, voice is a little laggy today, Blake. Do you know it? that? Yeah, no, I breaking didn't. up and stuff. So more, more than a little, unfortunately. Okay, well, yeah. I I don't, you know. Really? Oh, I yeah. wanted to be gentle about it. But and no, 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 that's good. fine. As long, uh, hey, if 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 I'm breaking up a little bit, I'm breaking up a little. Now bit. you're clear as a bell. Well, that's because I'm not moving my mouse. Okay, that may be it. Then. That might that might be it. Um, so this is really key support. 133, 133.30. That's going to be really critical support for the dollar Canadian. Um, I, keep in mind that we do still have a pennant formation. That still is not complete and that and it completes at the 135 level. Now, most of you guys know this because I've talked a lot about it. I'm still very bullish at dollar Canadian, but that doesn't mean that I'm bullish right at this moment because we do have to see what the BOC does. Um, but the fact that we had a false breakdown has led us to a breakout. Most of you know this already that listen here every day because uh, I've been playing the dollar Canadian on the long side a lot for the last week and a half. Um, for a couple of different reasons, knowing that it was technically it was a false breakdown in December, uh, but more importantly, I've been playing this because I do feel that the false breakdown leads to a bigger breakout, and we, we're dealing with risk aversion. So risk aversion tends to be Canadian currency uh, weak. Uh, so I've been you know I, I've been playing the Canadian on the short side playing the dollar Canadian on the long side. The big, the bigger trade that I've been taking is the Euro Canadian, really. But um, that was you know, a week and a half ago. So right now I'm just kind of, uh, kind of uh, more focused on the dollar Canadian. But I, I think while we're above 133.30, this is gonna be really key support. You could even say it, we could dip down to 133. Even if we dip down to 133, you're probably gonna find buyers because we did dip down to 133.20 uh, and still, you know, was bid up. So I, I'm, I, I would be very skeptical about being on the short side while above 133. Now, a break above 134 right here would be very bullish. 
And like I said, this is more dependent on the Bank of Canada, not so much, you know, you can, you can have your, your opinions, but when it comes to central banks, it's really going to be more of, you know, what the central bank does is going to determine what this pair does. So I think above 134 is bullish, below 133 is bearish. You know, you could buy dips to 133 and change, or you can sell rallies to 134, you know, but a break of the, one of those two levels is going to probably drive its market. And that's what I'll be paying attention to, okay? Uh, going into uh, today's Bank of Canada meeting. Matter of fact, I heard Steve and Stelios here a little bit ago, um, and, and I guess I wanna ask you guys, what do you think here with the Bank of Canada? Because I'm not sure how the market's gonna respond. It, let's say that the Bank of Canada uh, delivers uh, a Fed type of cut and they cut a half a basis point, what's the Canadian currency going to do? Is it going to strengthen because it's going to be better for the Canadian economy or is it going to be weaker uh, and the dollar Canadian, just gets steam, or the Canadian dollar gets steamrolled? What do you guys think there? Because it, it's, a, it's a viable question, which I don't think I have, a, I have an answer that I'm confident with. Well, personally, I think, um, so what, what are we pricing for Canada today? Do you remember you, you mentioned we're pricing point. 40 basis points. 40, okay. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's a toss up between, you know, a quarter basis point or a half basis. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a good question, you know, it versus the dollar. Uh, I, I personally think that the dollar is going to, is going to weaken. And I've, been, I've said this for a while now. I think it's going to, uh, you know, yesterday's cut was the beginning and I think it's going to keep weakening going forward. Um, so versus the dollar, I think the, the CAD will struggle to get uh, any higher. Dollar CAD will struggle to get much higher. Where's that high? Is it 134.6? Is 134.6, yeah. Um, I don't know. If they do 50, I. it's a good question. Hmm. Yeah, I, you know, and that I don't know. And, and that, what do you think, Steve? Um, I, I, everybody knows that I'm very bearish long term the dollar, uh, but I've, I've said multiple times that if there is one pair that I'm bullish the dollar against, that's the Canadian. And as long as we are above the breakout area at 133, I can't, you know, I can't really turn bearish. So, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you the, with the dollar, but I think it's, you have to be specific on what your you have to be specific on what you're um, uh, uh, trading the dollar against. I don't think this is your your, your vanilla long dollar, short dollar market. I I, I believe that- the I agree with you, not yet. Gonna, yeah, I, I believe that the commodity currencies are gonna be very weak. I just, you know, uh, here, here's the one thing that I, I do have to point out. The Aussie dollar has been really strong and um, we've had a really nice, we've, we've had a really nice sound. Matter of fact, if you guys are, uh, you know, harmonic guys, you got to be looking at this today, right? This is a, uh, this right here, the, the, the Aussie should fail from this intraday, it should, it should roll over, right? But um, I, I just read a, a pretty uh, extensive report on the Aussie uh, from a bank that they're, you know, very, very cautious about being bearish down here. But if, you know, I think it really, you know, it's more determined on global prospects if they continue to stay weak. The virus, no pun intended, lingers longer than expected, then, you know, I think the Aussie is going to continue to stay heavy. And same with the Canadian and also the Kiwi. But we have seen a really big, you know, overall beat down of these commodity currencies, which, you know, uh, they are a little, uh, in my opinion, oversold and they were oversold. Um, we hit the, you know, big 161% extension or we're bouncing, but, um, but also we're, we're facing some pretty key resistance because if you look at you know, longer term, this 38% retracement for the, for the Aussie comes in at 66.60. So I think while we're below 66.60, you know, you gotta, you gotta, think, yeah, this has been a nice bounce, but you know, it might be a, a bounce that you sell into. So th there's a situation where you're playing the dollar on the long side, but I wouldn't necessarily do that against the Euro. So the better play is probably long Euro Aussie, you know, which is, you know, it, or, 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 or you play, you know, the dollar short against the European currencies and the, and the dollar long against the commodity currencies. You know, it's, you know, 
however you decide you want to play it, I think there's different ways to play that specific trade. So anyway, uh, so the, just give you guys some food for thought as we go into today. Hey, let me uh, let me let me mention uh, if you guys and gals have not used Forex Analytics, make sure you do so. Try it out. It's only one dollar for ten days. Uh, you know, try it out. Download the mobile app. Um, if you're using and testing Forex analytics in the platform, uh, you also will have access to our chat room. Um, and that's where I'm at all day. So, you, you know, right here, you go to the chat room and if you want to chat with me, that's where I'm, I'm at probably 10, 12 hours a day at least. So, uh, with that being said, I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Steven Stelios and, uh, guys, it's all yours. Thank you, Thank Blake. You, Blake. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Hey, have a great one, Dale, and uh, have a good one, Dale. Thank you for being you here too, and have a buddy. great interview, Dale. Thank you, man. All right, man. See you guys. All right. Bye-bye, hey, man. Bye, so we Steve. have uh, gone. Sorry, Dale, you're going to say. Oh, yeah. The, you know, I just want to uh, say that was a great, uh, great direction that you gave people yesterday, Steve, about that any Fed cut would be a shorting opportunity. That was one yeah, of the best turnaround. Yeah, Tuesday. I think we would have turned directly down. Uh, the markets are getting some relief rally today because the chances of a Bernie Sanders presidency uh, definitely got somewhat cut down yesterday with Biden uh, almost like dominating. A hundred all, handle, almost a hundred handle. Yeah, uh, Biden. From there. Biden almost dominated if, if actually uh, he had won California as well. I think that would, that would have been more or less, you know, a done deal. Um, now, you know, I, I might be misinterpreting uh, uh, what Blake thinks, but what I, what I heard was that Biden had a better chance of beating Trump. And that's why um, Trump uh, is telling supporters on uh, during – uh, primaries that are open for everyone to vote to support Bernie because his preference was to run against Bernie. Uh, I, I think so I'm that not would sure be, which one. I think that would be uh, quite a mistake, uh, likely, because we've seen politics getting uh, by the month more polarizing. And in that sense, I believe that as Trump was the preference of every democratic candidate in 2016, believing that they can easily uh, win against him, which, you know, definitely proved not to be the case. I mean, Hillary Clinton was the, yeah. you know, the stronger candidate. So you think know. Bernie has a better shot? I think that with people getting more frustrated, uh, Bernie might have a better shot if the economy is going down uh, to a recession because, you know, we still have several months until the election. And during yeah. those several months, if we've now seen the high and if this coronavirus disruption was the last push that an economy that was clear, showing clear signs of slowing down since almost one and a half years ago um, goes into a recession, I think that during a period of recession, Bernie Sanders will probably have um, a better chance of winning by saying, you know, look at what capitalism did, etc. Of course, you know, none of that is the fault of capitalism because unfortunately capitalism isn't there. But, you know, look at what capitalism did. You know, you have to give a chance to socialism and socialism, you know, is going to work for us, etc., etc. A lot of young people that don't understand, um, um, you know, how, th how an economy works, and most importantly, unfortunately, not having much of a historical knowledge, uh, we'll go for it. So I do think that if we're going into a recession, which I now consider a, a rather high probability, Bernie Sanders might actually be a better candidate um, against Trump. Uh, now, Joe Biden, I'm, I'm afraid, I mean, by, by, by having watched him a few times, I'm afraid he's not going to be able to hold against Trump in, in debates because, you know, it's clearly, uh, he's clearly not the man he used to be. I mean, I don't think he's, you know, 100%. And 
I'm not sure he can go through this uh, process without, you know, uh, getting exposed too much. So, um, you know, if people could vote without having any of the candidates go in debates or talk to them, you know, he might be a good candidate, but I'm afraid that Trump will actually expose him for, you know, not being 100% fit to be a president. Yeah, I okay. think I, I think Trump is gonna is almost a done deal now. <laughs> Again, really? so I mean I don't know. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That's my impression. Could be. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Still, still, clearly, if the economy and the stock market tank, Trump doesn't have a solid chance against anybody, because, you know, I I kept saying that since the first year of the Trump presidency. Uh, I thought that actually the economy would go down sooner than that, but they managed to postpone the inevitable by, first of all, giving it an artificial boost by increasing deficit spending, public spending, and decreasing taxation. So that gave a lifeline to the economy that lasted it like one and a half years. Then we got monetary policy getting loose again, which again, you know, was enough to somewhat support it for several months. Um, I said since the beginning that Trump is doing a huge mistake so late in this business cycle to tie his success or failure as a presidency to the fate of the stock market. Because, you know, you live by the, yeah. by the sword, you die by the sword. So, so if, for him, it'd be great to get this 20% correction or whatever it's going to be over with by April or May and have the market recovering into the fall. Every time somebody has talked about a 20% recession and I, I will insist. You that mean correction. Although, although yeah. Uh, sorry, correction. Yeah. Um, and I will insist that although I, you know, from a fundamental thesis, you know, we, we are in the same school of economics with David and I agree, you know, 100% with his viewpoint of the economy and his assessment. I'm not so convinced as he is that they will manage to reinflate the bubble uh, they might, they might not. In my opinion, it's at best a 50-50. Well, they I started keep... They started yesterday. <laughs> but, but, you that, know, does but... it seem successful to you so far? <laughs> well, no, you know, because everything, uh, monetary policy has a six-month lag or so. So, uh, you know, they've been... They don't, uh... they don't have six months, though. You understand what I mean, Dale, right? Yeah. Uh, and if you remember what I said yeah. many times yeah. ago when we were talking about the possibility of... Um, of a correction, uh, right? Um, or, uh, you know, um, more than a 20% move lower anyhow. Uh, I kept saying that this market is mostly now supported by artificial asset price, in, uh, asset price inflation. And I think that once that bubble gets pricked, uh, there is no return so late in the business cycle. So... My assessment is that once we see the indices tumble more than 20% lower, uh, I don't give them a good chance of managing to reinflate this bubble before it completely deflates. So for me, I, I totally get where you're coming from that, okay, if they can get a 20% correction now and then have several months ahead to start reinflating it, then that might not hurt um, Trump's chances of getting reelected. That's your point, right? But, you know, my counter argument to that is 11 years into this business cycle with so many actual problems uh, and at an economy that is extremely weak, um, you know, there might not be a way to actually get out of a correction, no matter how much they try. Keep in mind that after yesterday's rate cut, the Fed is just now 1% above zero. So having to do with interest rates, they don't have any more uh, room to the downside. I mean, they do, but it's not the kind of room that would make a big difference to the economy. Having to do with quantitative easing, they're already doing a mo the most aggressive version of quantitative easing they've ever done. Yesterday uh, alone, they offered 100 billions overnight of, of, of repo, and that was actually oversubscribed by something like an, another 10 billion, 8, 10 billion or whatever. Now, of course, they can increase it even further. But what I'm saying is, I think we've definitely reached the point of diminishing returns. So I'm very, very, very skeptical that they can actually do something to, you know, to turn this train, train around. That's, that's my point of view. Um, so I would be very, very skeptical with 
um, that possibility. Uh, now, um, okay, Estelio, what yes. else did we have before we go to the a church? Actually, talking about Biden and Trump, you know, we're talking about the, that Biden might have trouble on debates and stuff, but no, you've heard Trump speak as well, right? <laughs> or tweet. It's like, you know, the two of them. I mean, is, is this the best two politicians there are? The problem, Stelio, is anyway, that you know, it's, a, lot it's, of people, a lot of people are seeing Trump as... Um, you know, a special case, you know what I mean? But I don't think there are people that consider him uh, senile, you know, that, is that the right word? Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, it is what it is, you know. But, yeah, um, now, now okay. you know that I don't like Trump. Uh, and, you know, I, I do consider him, you know, in, in many aspects, uh, you know, yes, when he's talking, he's like, many times I feel like I'm hearing like a 10-year-old child uh, speak. But that hasn't actually changed. I mean, they voted him being that and he's not showing any signs that, you know, he's losing it. So they liked him as he is. Now, I have no idea why, but, you know, that's how it was. So, you know, that's not a new factor that you have to price in in, in, his, yeah. in his probabilities, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so otherwise, I mean, the main news again is the coronavirus. And our friend here is saying... Uh, the coronavirus is yesterday's news. It's nearly but, dead. I disagree with that. Sorry, let me, think, let me completely disagree with I, that as well. I think that the effects from that will be felt for months and months. I'm just reading a headline here. Flybe, the, um, the airline, UK airline, is, are saying they're running out of cash. They need uh, uh, support from the government or whatever. You know, it's... Yeah, I've seen so many airlines, pictures yeah, of, airlines of flights been, that, are, that are like empty, like there are five yeah, people yeah. on board. Airlines have been hit massively, but I think the effects of all this are going to be felt for months and months. And you're seeing, you saw the uh, announcement that Italian schools and universities are going to be closed. All sorts of, uh, uh, um, you know, events are cancelled. Uh, there is a fake trader. He's linking Lufthansa Group to ground 150 aircraft due to go. coronavirus. There you go. Um, it's just people are not going out. They're not doing business. They're very uh, protective of, of themselves, right? And it's, it makes sense. And if the Fed cut another 100 base points, are they going to go, go out and start doing stuff? No, nope. they're not. You know, so, they couldn't care less about, you know, uh, you, you know yeah. the, <laughs> rate cuts are not going to make you feel safer. And that the problem at, at the moment, the problem is, you know, uh, supply has been massively disrupted and demand has massively decreased but the reason that demand has gone down has nothing to do with the affordability of money yeah. nothing to do with it yeah 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 exactly exactly and um so yeah this is still dominating news and uh yeah cruise lines offer already 30 percent discounts I and mean, if, trust me if, they're going to have to offer even even more if it's not 90 percent i don't think <laughs> yeah. interesting. so uh, you know my my opinion is uh, we're still going to be talking about this for a while and the effects okay maybe when we go into the summer the virus itself is going to be uh contained but the effects are going to keep going um so i think you know uh, the stock market any rally should be sold my humble i read opinion. it's oh. going to be around for three years i uh posted oh, uh, also all, also something else okay. to consider and they've said that multiple times unfortunately the global economy is extremely sick uh Mostly the U.S. economy, and I know that you know, if you are reading the you know media, you would think that's the you know exact opposite. But you know, numbers don't lie. If we wanted to be honest with our calculations of growth, the vast majority of economies would be in a recession since ten plus years ago. Because what kind of a growth do you have when to produce? X amount of GDP growth, so, uh, you know, increase uh, yeah. in... Like in China as well. Yeah, you need multiple times that in debt. That's not growth. I mean, if we wanted to be honest with um, accounting, with, you know, countries accounting, first of all, we would apply the same rules that we do apply to companies. So, for example, uh, unfunded liabilities should be counted at that year's GDP. So when during a year you make promises of, of, of paying in the future 5 trillion in whatever, pensions, Medicaid, Medicare, you know, whatever the hell else, you should count that in that year's GDP. Countries don't do that. 
bottom line, the US, for example, for the decade that we're, you know, we just started has $120 trillion of unfunded liabilities. Add to that the fact that the US is running something close to a 9% deficit. If you count what, you know, you would go to jail if you didn't count uh, what they call off budget items. So if you add the on budget and the off budget items, so if you just calculate the amount of debt uh, that, you know, they, they need to raise every um, year just to, you know, fund the budget, you know, that's eight to 9% deficit before actually officially going in a recession. I mean, you know, those numbers are like scary. I mean, as scary as they can be. So bottom line, the global economy is sick. The US economy is extremely sick. So when you get some type of an event like a coronavirus, uh, when the underlying economy is extremely sick, the economy cannot actually get past that. Now, if the economy was actually healthy, yes, some event like coronavirus would definitely do some short-term harm to the economy, but the economy would get over it. But, you know, when the patient is extremely sick and you give him a flu, the flu might kill him. So that's the exact example. It's like you have a cancer patient at a very, very bad condition, and then he gets the flu. Would the, would the flu kill a healthy patient? No. But, you know, can it kill a cancer patient that's like, you know, in the borderline between life and death? Yes, it can. So that's, you know, the exact analogy here. I like this uh, version. Dr. Steve talking. Yeah, I like Steve, <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? And Stel, I know you're uh, looking for a top in the uh, European bond market. So uh, we really had a waterfall um, exaggerated move in the 10 year. We got down to 90 and I thought 110 was ambitious and we have some bottoming action in US dollar yen. What do you guys think? Uh, could we be near the end of this? Uh, I heard some guy talking about 25%, uh, a quarter point 10 year yield coming. But um, I look at this and to me, it looks like that may have been exhaustion in the 10 year where you guys at on bonds and U.S. dollar yen? I, I personally think uh, your um, bonds have very little leeway now. I mean, uh, the, I think the, the, I, the, I think the same even more applies to to treasuries. Stadio. But treasuries, man, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm really not sure. You know, 30-year bonds are negative, so why couldn't they go to zero? Now, if, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you why. How yeah. can you compare the health of the U.S. economy to the German economy? I, I can't. I'm just saying in the short yeah. term. If, if they that, cut, but but if that's they cut a big difference. Zero, yeah, yeah, that's no, a but, big difference, though. Yeah, but this is 100 base points. First right of all, now, so. first of all <laughs> both, of them, both of them are trading at irrational levels. There's no question about it. I mean, future generations are going to be looking at this period with yields being what they are, with the fundamentals of economies being what they are, and they're going to be like, oh, my God. I mean, how couldn't they yeah. see that that was biggest, like the biggest bubble ever? Biggest mispricing of risk. Yeah, mi think. biggest yeah. mispricing of risk in, in, in the history of, of mankind, right? Yeah. Uh, certainly, you know, books like 20 years later are going to be talking about it. Now, you know, the next question comes, okay, can you really time the, you know, the top or the bottom in yields if we want to talk about yields? It's very tough. It's very tough. But I, I will agree with you that if you're looking at the longer term picture, you know, taking the other side, you know, now makes sense. It makes sense. You might find yourself being out of the money for a period, but I don't think that's going to be you know, such a long period. <laughs> I'll, tell, I'll ask you something else. Would you sell 10 year treasuries at 1% or 10 year Greece at 1%? I think that's an easy question. Easy answer, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I, 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 if I was to short something, I wouldn't sell treasuries yet. I, I, think, I think they're going to a place where they're going to be sold massively, but I, I just don't think yet. I could be wrong. I've been wrong many times. Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah. Estelle, you know, that's a good point. And uh, maybe uh, we really don't have a big bear market in bonds until we have a big bear market in the dollar. Yeah, yeah, could be. Could that be it? Yeah. I mean, Speaking the currency, which, underlying that's, currency. That's the first uh, yeah. chart I wanted to talk about today. Look where yeah, the does dollar... It, is that impulsive, Steve, would you say? Found for support. For the first time? 
as I've, told, as I've told you before, yeah, we've seen quite a nice move lower, but look at this channel. In a hurry. I want to see this channel break down, and I want to okay. see a lower low, so below 96.36. Right. And so far, what we saw was that the dollar reversed exactly from this channel resistance and found support exactly at this channel support. With the stock market. Yeah, so no, it was even weaker than the stock market because until today it didn't rebound. Where risk came back a few days ago. Indeed, you're right. But the dollar didn't respond. You know, um, yeah. And even today, so far, what we have is an inside day. Right. That's so what I mean. Not. It's really weak. Nothing to really write home about. I do give it a little bit more credibility, though combining it with the fact that we did find support of the channel. So, you know, uh, seeing an inside candlestick when we just found support at an important channel, you know, uh, the risk reward in the short term would be tilted for a little bit more of a rebound, at least in the dollar. That would also bode well since now we see a direct relationship between um, a positive correlation between, you know, what um, uh, risk is doing and what the dollar is doing. Um, let's go down actually to a four hour chart. I think it's going to show even better. So if we could get something like this, right? It is likely, it is likely that we might see another leg higher and then lower. Uh, in any case, I've started building a short position in the S and P because I think it's quite tough to assess if we're going to manage to, uh, you know, probe new highs towards the 61.8, so closer, let's say, to 3,200, uh, or we're going to fail sooner than that. My conviction remains very, very high that in any case, you know, this market should be sold. As with, you know, any stock uh, market, I think we're going lower, as simple as that. So um, Biden... Uh, becoming the likely candidate or anyhow increasing a lot the probabilities of becoming a likely candidate and reducing the probabilities of Bernie Sanders being the next president substantially is positive for the markets. Um, Fed trying to do whatever it, it could is positive for the markets, but even the combination of the two, I don't think there will be enough for this market to actually turn higher and go to new highs. So I'm still looking lower, as, as simple as that. And uh, as I said, there is a decent chance that this market, this bubble has found its break. And, you know, after that, you know, what starts mattering is uh, valuations and people running for safety. Um, and, you know, as simple as that. If, if you look at the DAX, it's a similar situation here. I, I do think that this move lower... Uh, was impulsive since we broke through this ascending wedge. So I'm looking lower. Um, the FTSE has broken through a diamond, a large diamond formation. Might, you know, rebound a little bit further, even closer towards 7,100. But I do think it's also going to turn lower. In general, I'm, I'm, I'm very bearish risk at the moment. And, you know, I feel fine uh, building short positions. Now, there was a question uh, if I'm still short uh, palladium and the answer is absolutely yes i'm still short palladium i actually increased even further my position yesterday a little bit um i now have one third of a full position the reason i'm i'm not jumping into a full position is because it's extremely volatile so you know having a full position here would mean either you know very big profits or you know big losses uh, so, you know, I had to adapt my position size based on extreme volatility because I remind you that Palladium just last week, it had a, at some point a day that had a 13% range. Uh, so, you know, 13% move is, you know, insane. It's something that you would expect to see only from a stock during earnings day uh, and definitely not from a precious metal, right? Uh, my cost average has now dropped a little bit because I added once we broke through 2,500. So my uh, cost average now is uh, almost exactly at 2,600. So I'm I'm decently in the, in the money. I mean, we're at 2,460. I'm like $140 in the money. And I'm not going to have a problem increasing it even further 
to um, um, to a half a position. I don't think I'm going to easily go above half a position here. Uh, but you know, if we're headed where I think we're headed, even with half a position, I, I think I can make a killing here. So yes, I, I, I do still have my position. And by the way, I forgot to thank yesterday. Um, I think it was Stavros that brought my attention uh, to the fact that natural gas had actually reached uh, a long-term target I had in mind. So, you know, I, I bought half a position and that has moved very, very nicely. I entered that 1.7 and we're currently like, what is it, like 6% higher or whatever. Um, you know, it's just half a position, but, you know, quite a nice move. And I'm, I'm willing to add to it if we manage actually to break above this descending um, channel. Now, uh, in the same manner, we've seen crude rebounding. Crude actually posted a very nice key reversal on the daily chart. Um, it was Monday. Um, and, you know, it might rebound even further from here. Although as long as we remain below the previous low at 49.30, I would still remain very cautious. So we did have a nice RSI divergence. We did have a nice key reversal on the daily chart. Um, but, you know, since I'm expecting more risk off in the days that follow, you know, uh, I wouldn't be very optimistic about the fate of uh, crude because I, I, I think it's highly unlikely uh, that indices are going to start tanking lower and crude is going to be uh, rebounding. It's not impossible, but it's a low probability scenario. And of course, I'm not blind to it. The same applies to natural gas. That's why I still have just half of a position and I remain very cautious as long as we're capped by this descending channel. So, you know, I'm not going to be, uh, you know, shooting for the sky here because as far as I'm concerned, we're still in a bear market until proven otherwise. Um, so I'm going to protect, you know, uh, my profits. Uh, I'm going to be trailing my stop loss, perhaps even later today. Uh, I think I might move it to 175, which was that low uh, to, uh, you know, to lock in uh, some of my profits here. Um, Steve, no bubble anymore, just a little overvalued and will continue to be. Gautam, uh, sorry to say, mate, I completely disagree with your point of view. This is all good news. That is how we kill the virus. We have to look past near-term disruption. Stock investing is long-term, so long as we control negative economic impact and avoid a recession. How can you control negative economic impact in an economy that is in a very bad position? Uh, fiscally, it's as close to blowing up as possible. Let me be very clear. If the dollar was not a world reserve currency with the current fiscal position of the US, uh, the US economy would have already uh, blown up to kingdom come, as simple as that. Um, so um, also people had similar opinions with yours having to do with the health and the longevity of uh, Japan and people that were buying the Nikkei in 1999 and in 1990, when it initially started moving lower, uh, there's been 30 years since, and they're still like 30, 40% out of the money. So I have no idea what makes you think that the same fate cannot find the US. Um, so personally, uh, I do think that in the long term, stock investing, yeah, it's, you know, it's something profitable, uh, but you also need to keep in mind the big picture. And the big picture tells me that the long-term fate of the U.S. economy is at the best case scenario in doubt. Um, and what worries me even more is that uh, at least, you know, for pretense, uh, for example, the Republicans used to play because they never you know, they never produced, but they used to play the fiscally responsible party. And now not even Republicans care about deficits, debt or whatever. Not that they ever actually did something about it. So let me be very clear. Unfortunately, both the US parties, the, both the Democrats and, and, and the Republicans, they kept increasing public spending every time they were uh, in power um, and not really compensate with, you know, 
uh, any real measures. So, for example, it's not that the actually increased taxes, not that I'm for increasing taxes because increasing taxes has not a positive effect. So, you know, the only way to go about it is decrease regulation, decrease public spending, so you can keep taxes, you know, to a minimum. And that is how the U.S. became a superpower. And the opposite reason is why the U.S. is in big danger of, you know, becoming a pariah, uh, slowly but surely. Um, uh, we'll be ready in two minutes. So your, your guest is here. He says he's, he will be ready in yes. two minutes. Anyhow, we yes. start in five. Uh, I would agree with you, Jim. Republicans pretend to care about debt only when Democrats are in office. I agree with you. Yeah, it's hi hypocritical, but at least they were pretending. Now they don't even pretend, you know what I mean? So now, now it's like both parties have accepted that the way forward is just, you know, continuing to be fiscally responsible. Uh, schools closing, starting Chicago and New York, both have some schools being closed, Washington State considering two. So this is not close to over. Uh, I 100% agree with you. I think we haven't seen um, uh, the height of this coronavirus panic or crisis. I think that in the month ahead, we're going to have uh, much more uh, to panic about. Uh, I'm not advocating that people should panic, panic by the way. Um, I do think that you should be extremely careful if, if you belong to the percentage of the population that is, um, uh, you know, sensitive, like you have some pre-existing health conditions or, you know, very old age or whatever. Should Other I stop than going to karaoke? Because once, <laughs> once in a while, my mouth will hit the mic. And, uh, I, I think if you it. stop going to karaoke, uh, uh -huh. you're going to die without the need of coronavirus. So you should uh, keep doing Yeah, my soul will die. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and, and the kitty surprised. agrees, too. So, yes. Okay. All right. Yes. And, and the leaky does agree, indeed. Now, uh, another important development from a technical perspective, not coincidentally, the exact opposite development we had in the DXY is the fact that EURUSD did make an attempt intraday to break above this channel, but uh, actually so far it's failing. So I do foresee what we said in advance that initially this channel might reject price action. So far it seems to be doing so. So a pullback towards 11060 or even a little bit lower towards 110 uh, might get people interested in buying the pair again. And if that happens, I think that next time we're moving, moving higher, probably the channel is not going to be um, enough to reject uh, price action. And we might see a breakout in the Euro USD and the breakdown uh, in the DXY. Um, so that covers that as well. Uh, cable was weak today, reversed higher later on. Um, pay close attention to this. We are back testing this broken triangle. You can see it here. So we're back testing this broken triangle trend line support as the resistance. And if you look at the four hour chart in the cable, let me pull it up. Here it is. And if you look at the four hour chart, you will notice that on the four hour chart, we can also see here a symmetrical triangle we're coiling within the symmetrical triangle. So in any case, uh, 128.50, let's say, quite important as resistance. So below 128.50, um, you know, I, I would understand why somebody would want to be short the cable, but above 128.50, I think we can squeeze higher. So uh, in my opinion, you don't want to be in the, in the wrong side of the market if that happens. So that's what I'm monitoring here in, uh, in cable. Uh, let me go through some of your questions. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Yesterday's, yeah, okay, we read that. The Lufthansa news. Sanders lacks black support. Yeah, uh, that's what seems to be giving uh, Biden you know, his, uh, his strength, uh, the fact that he, he really dominates 
uh, in the African American among the African American voters. Yes, that is very true. Um, so, having to do with the USD card, since a lot of you are asking, I I'm going to stand to what I said. Let me pull it up and show you. So, here is the USD card. Big move lower after getting rejected from that confluence of resistances. But look at this. We found support by back testing this uh, formations, this big triangle trend line resistance and support. Also, breakout area, multiple types of resistances now turn support here. So, bottom line, uh, as long as 133 holds on a daily closing basis, um, you know, I, I have to remain bullish here for a move towards 135.60. Only breakdown from 133 is going to turn me bearish. Okay, as simple as that. And the risk reward definitely favors uh, long positions here because you can have like, let's say, a half percent of a stop loss looking to make like 1.4%. So it's like almost a three to one risk reward. I, I would have to call that healthy, right? Yeah, held where it had to. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, coach. Uh, gold, silver, uh, palladium. I already covered uh, palladium, but very briefly, and sorry for forgetting to do that. Now, if you remember, I kept saying again and again, gold might, might correct lower, but don't be short gold because in such a market, gold can explode in your face. Now, yesterday was a good lesson of exactly what I meant. Yesterday, we had a $60 up day following the emergency cut from the Fed. And, you know, I, I said yesterday that so far that retest of these broken triangles, trend line resistance acting as support seems to be holding. No question about it. After exploding higher following the emergency cut, keep looking higher, as simple as that. And that is why you don't try to make a few pennies sorting a correction when you're in a bull market, because that might happen, as simple as that. Silver also had like a big day higher, but again, no question about it. Gold is still overperforming silver. And as I said again yesterday, if you want to be long one of the two until proven otherwise, you should be long gold. And I do think that long might all, uh, gold might already be on its way to the next upside objective, which is the 78.6% FIB of the all-time high, which passes, if I remember right, from 1733. And that concludes what I had to say. Thank you, Coach. Okay, buddy. Tavi, I want to welcome you back to FACE. I'm going to get you set up now. Welcome back, Tavi. Hi, Dale. How are you? Oh, uh, you know, everyone's trying to find their bearings. Uh, we haven't seen this type of action last week, uh, I believe. Wasn't it the uh, fastest 10% correction in market history? Yeah, one of them. <laughs> okay, so um, I don't remember from our last interview, Tavi, but do you want to scare, uh, share your screen or do you want me to show the different I personally don't time. have anything to share here unless... Okay, uh, then uh, I will. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to share our screen. Why don't we start with the S&Ps, Tavi? So uh, just to let people know, uh, you're a hedge fund manager, mm -hmm. and here's your company, Crescat Capital, mm -hmm. and uh, you mainly work with accredited investors, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. All right, what, what's a new requirement for accredited? Uh, is it a quarter million outside of your house? or It's actually a million, yeah. It's a million now. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, okay, so you have all different types of funds. Uh, why don't I start with this? Was your long short fund uh, the most? Uh, which one of your funds had the best week last week? <laughs> Global macro fund was up uh, significantly uh, less last week, and that's because we're uh, being able to implement what we call the macro trade of the century, which is being long gold and uh, renminbi terms and long gold in dollars and long gold in, in Hong Kong dollars as well, uh, okay. relative to being short stocks. And that's, you know, obviously that that was a uh, we got hurt uh, on, on precious metals. But I think the 
the gains from the shorts, uh, you know, uh, offset the, the, that pain. And I think this week has been, uh, it's been going a little bit better, at least yesterday. Today, probably going to be a pullback, uh, given how the market is reacting uh, from uh, the Super Tuesday. Okay, so, uh, I mean, uh, this definitely changed the character of the market that, we, that has been ongoing for quite some time. Uh, although we've had these interruptions before, uh, you know, maybe back to the end of 2018 when all the former Fed chairmen got together with Powell and they all held hands, remember Davi, and they sang Kumbaya and Powell reverse course and we had a, a short a short squeeze all last year do you think this is just a pause that refreshes or is it um, perhaps the beginning of a bear market and I only say that because of this formation which is a megaphone formation Tavi that we uh, took out we had an overthrow and now we're trading back in inside of this megaphone formation and if it's valid you know if you look at the bottom of my line it's possible for us to see a 2000 spx in my uh you know way off base here and this is uh, the buying opportunity of the century or should i be raising cash on strength and looking for more shorting opportunities what do you think yeah, that's a good question. I, 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 I'm on the camp that I think this is the beginning of a bear market, and I've, I've been in that camp for a bit, uh, given how macro indicators have been deteriorating for some time now. Uh, from, from, uh, from that perspective, I, I, I think that what, why the market hasn't really turned was because of the labor market and consumer confidence that held up pretty well in 2019, yeah. right? You know, even before the coronavirus situation, we saw equity earnings beginning to uh, the growth begin to contract instead. Uh, we've had the yield curve inversions reaching the 73% level. Um, we've had jobless claims, uh, uh, continuing jobless claims begin to rise on a year over year basis. All, the, all those are cracks in the labor markets uh, and uh, the venture capital activity that begin to slow down significantly. Um, and and I, you know, I think that now with the coronavirus, that's just a, uh, that's just the tip of the iceberg, especially uh, when it all started at the worst place at the worst time. I mean, there's never a good time and a good place for that to happen. But China truly is um, uh, the place that, you know, it's, it's holiday, it was holidays in China. It was the time of the year that um, uh, the Chinese people spend most money. Um, and, and obviously that wasn't the case. Um, at the same time as, as we have perhaps the largest credit imbalance that we have in the world today, historically speaking, um, and, you know, I think that that China being responsible for over 60% of, uh, of GDP growth since the global financial crisis, I believe strongly that, um, that that's going to have an impact. And now the outbreak is really global now. It, it became a pandemic, and especially in places like South Korea, which is a key economy for the, glo for, for the world. Um, and, and every electronic piece is basically... Uh, they they made, made my car. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, you got Samsung um, and and so many other companies, and and I think that that's uh, that will it's it's even worse than than Italy. Obviously, <laughs> uh, we're, we're talking about markets here, not not not, not about humans, but uh, and which is awful. Uh, but but I think I think it's getting worse, and I think the markets initially, I think that gold, especially and precious metals. Uh, the prior weeks were uh, really being a precursor of of this of the sell off in equities, and uh, and then and then we had the sell off in equities. Gold sort of got ahead of itself. Uh, precious metals overall got ahead of itself in the short term with the CFTC positioning. You have RSI is getting an extreme, especially on silver. Um, and I think that we're now resetting that position, and uh, especially RSI, even an S and P five hundred. Now it's not as extreme as it was a few. Uh, a few days ago. Uh, so um, I think we're resetting again. If you ask me what's my favorite investment, it still is being, being, you know, buying gold, buying precious metals and selling stocks is that ratio of gold to S&P 500. I still believe strongly that that's going to be uh, ultimately what, what continues to rise here. Uh, if you look, I, I published this yesterday, looking at a chart of silver to uh, uh, Russell 3000, just a Broadway look at stocks in general. And you can see 
we basically just form almost a perfect double bottom and it's been rising and making uh, higher lows recently. Um, look at I that. Think, what a producer I am. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm not only an interviewer. Uh, look at this. There's a <laughs> Tavi's chart right here. Okay. Yeah. Silver at equities. Okay. Because that's interesting because uh, I mainly look at the gold silver ratio. And this is the opposite of uh, what we've been seeing. And so silver to equities, when's the last time we were here in 2000? Wow. Okay. Yeah. How do you execute a trade like that? Well, there's, there's many, there are many ways. Um, the way we find uh, more attractive is uh, on, the, on the long side is to look for, uh, we, we're not just long silver, by the way, we're long silver, gold, platinum. We're long uh, yeah. a selective uh, number of, of, uh, of miners, um, which is an industry that's been historically depressed. And so it's more of a, a diversified way of being long precious metals and hopefully uh, uh, hoping to find uh, alpha here in this trade as, as we think this is going to, uh, to, uh, to play out well on the long side. On the short side, it's quite, quite the same. Uh, we're looking for the most, rather than just shorting the S&P 500 or the Russell 3000, regardless what index you want to look at, uh, we try to search for the most overvalued companies using our models and our process. Um, and a lot of those are actually in the U.S. So the, 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 the distortion of price to fundamentals are actually more, a little more extreme here in the U.S. In terms of banks overall, uh, not really. The banks uh, that we uh, like to be sure are banks in Canada, Australia, uh, even China. Uh, Commodity-based, is that why? Uh, you know, they're natural resource type economies. You would sure. think that you would uh, like those countries. Well, I would, unless uh, well, the problem is, is that uh, number one, um, well, we're not, we're, we, we try to be long oil. And I think the, the, the situation there is that coronavirus really changed the landscape for that, okay. number one. But, but uh, in terms of commodities, of being long commodities and me short equities, uh, we like first and foremost is, is precious metals. And uh, Canada and Australia and Hong Kong have a, Extreme, extreme ties with the Chinese economy in which uh, capital flows, right. outflows from China has been is exacerbating those markets, especially in the housing market of those places. And um, we believe strongly that that has been reflected on the banks. And when you look at the banks, actually, um, the valuations and multiples look a lot like the banks here of 07 and 06. Interesting. So, um, okay. just, so, uh, so the U.S. has cleaned up, uh, you know, a lot of the U.S. banks... Uh, have cleaned up their balance sheet that a lot of these other countries never addressed in the Great Recession? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. 2008, if it, 9? Yeah, I'm not sure if it was a fact of, uh, of they never addressed, but I think there's uh, from, uh, from economic cycles, globally uh, speaking more globally now, there's always someone as a country that is at the center of, of, of the imbalances that we see. I think what is at the center this time in terms of credit is certainly China. Uh, it is the economic driver of the world uh, with the shrinking current account problem it is becoming uh, more challenging for them to continue to, uh, to provide growth for the world. And you can see that by uh, little things like the, not little about, things, I'm very, showing, yeah, I'm showing the 10 year real yield in China has dipped into negative territory a chart you have on your website as well. And it looks like it's headed towards where it was in the depths of the great financial crisis, uh, the Great Recession, all the Correct. way to the left. So uh, if China's an engine of growth, why do they have negative real yields? Yeah, well, because they can't grow and they have to continue to reduce rates. If you look at Shiba rates, which uh, most of them, they're all manipulated, especially 10-year yields. Who buys 10-year yields in China, FYI? <laughs> it's, it's all- Let me ask you this, Who, who's gonna buy 10-year yields in, uh, the U.S. Uh, here's uh, just a, a look at a weekly chart of 10-year yields. To me, this looks like we're headed into some type of exhaustion. Yeah. Um, what are you telling um, your clients as far as owning U.S. sovereign debt? Are you avoiding it? Oh, are we, you we, taking profits we, on it? What are you doing here? We might we might reduce a little bit of one, one of our lags in that trade, but what we've been doing is actually we've been – uh, uh, sort of betting on the convergence of rates uh, between U.S. and global rates in general. So when you look okay. at the world today, you have about 17 economies that have their 30-year yields. 30-year yields are lower than overnight rates in the U.S. 
we thought that that was a tremendous opportunity. When you look throughout history, that actually happened, uh, that inversion, what we call the global yield curve inversion, actually happened in 06, 07, also happened in 1999 and in 2000 prior to those uh, downturns in the economy. And uh, what, what we've been doing is being short, let's say, German bonds, for instance, and being long treasury. So it's interesting. It's, in a, it's one way, yeah. And it, you can see that if you if you like, and I know you do technicals. Uh, yeah. Go ahead and look at the the, the German five year yield versus the U.S. five year yield, or I should say, the five year uh, U.S. five year yield versus German five year yield, and you can see that the uh, the spread between the two, when you look at the break uh, the breakdowns on that that ratio. Uh, it's, it's incredible. It's, uh, it, it almost perfectly marks um, the beginning of a recession. So uh, um, I think that that's, and, and they, that's usually because um, uh, the, the central banks uh, elsewhere are, are usually late to the party. Um, and in the U.S., money comes, comes into the U.S. So you have uh, a bid on the dollar. Um, and, and it's sort of what we're seeing, uh, I would say. But um, anyways. It, what is, I yeah. mean, do you automatically have a bearish view on the dollar because you have a constructive view on the gold, or could they you be constructive the dollar and gold at the same time? One hundred percent. If you think about mathematically, if you're long gold in dollars and you short remembi, you're essentially long gold in remembi terms. So it's not that we don't like gold versus dollar. We actually like that trade too, but we per, we actually prefer also to add other trades like being long gold and the most overvalued currencies in the world today. And if they're packed, that's okay. That means we're essentially long gold versus the dollar. But we're also adding this, uh, this asymmetry to the trade that could happen in case something depags, especially Hong Kong dollar and China, which oh, yeah. when you look at currency crises uh, in the past, they do have all the imbalances aligned and to have one. So, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a cheap way when you look at implied volatility for those trades to put out a, a put option on, on, on CNH USD or, or HKD USD. It's very clear that it's not very expensive for you to get enough notion in Delta notion exposure uh, to your portfolio. Okay. So we've seen uh, the Remembi snap back here. Yeah. Uh, do you think that uh, this peak at 720 uh, could have been it? Or do you think that, uh, you know, right here, uh, that this could be a decent, you know, uh, buying opportunity in U.S. dollar one, mm -hmm. uh, looking for more one weakness down the road? So here's your weekly trend. What are you thinking here? With Look, the, I actually uh, really trend? like trades that are the, the least clear trades in the world right now. And I think one of them is USC being long USCC and H because everyone is thinking the same. Uh, if the Fed is easing. Um, and, and, and that should have an impact on the dollar. There's some sort of a, um, a constructive way of, of, of reducing the dollar power globally, and, um, and, and that should have an impact on the USCCNH going lower. I, I okay. love that contrarian view, and I, I think actually um, it's quite the opposite. I think USCCNH has, uh, is, is, is in a pullback here, and I think, I think it looks incredibly uh, attractive as a, as a trade to be long. There is a high probability that that could uh, unwind in a big way. And you don't have to be extremely big in that trade. I mean, it, the asymmetry is incredible. Um, or not as good as Hong Kong dollar, I have to say. But uh, I, I do believe, though, that, you know, this, this recent decline in the equity markets that we had, it, it's a complete change in regime in terms of volatility. Um, and, yeah. and I think the investors are finally waking up for, to, the, to the risks that we're seeing in an overdue downturn in the business cycle. Uh, and I think, I think the Fed is losing control of the situation slowly. Um, we saw that clearly when they dropped interest rates and the market actually fell apart significantly. Um, and, you know, the conventional view that the central banks can prevent recessions has been proven again to be a complete fallacy. And then I, I think that further easing is, is, is inevitable, especially from the PBOC side as well. And the scenario is just incredibly bullish for gold, regardless what currency we, you want um, from, you know, gold and, and remembi, gold and, and Brazilian real and Canadian dollar and Aussie dollar, you name it. Can you think of one bearish fundamental for gold? Sure, I do. I actually think that if the renminbi falls apart in a huge way, uh, I think that could be deflationary. Uh, and also, Why, would China sell some of their gold reserves to defend their currency? Um, 
I don't think so. I, I think that they would, um, I, I think, I think a lot of their, their reserves are, is encumbered to be honest, but, um, but that's okay. my, my view on that. Um, I think that, uh, um, I think the issue with that is, is just, uh, I mean, it's a manufacturing plant of the world, plant of the world. So anything right. that you is built is built there and it everything is, if, if, if you want to value significantly, I think that will have an impact in the world. But um, another one is, is the coronavirus, which is the jury is still out. Is it a deflationary and inflationary? If you looked at inelastic products like food, water, you have to buy regardless. Right. Those, things, those things are probably going to rise. And that's food inflation. Uh, right. So CPI for food is going to be rising likely. And if that, again, if that plays out as is playing out in South Korea, in, uh, in Italy, um, we don't know yet what's going to be the case in the U.S. I have a feeling that the same way the market was ignoring coronavirus a week ago and all of a sudden just started to price that in, I think we're also sort of ignoring the fact that there has been a lack of tests on, on patients in general. Uh, and we might have a lot more cases than we think we do. Um, and you know, I think that, that that is also not priced in, in the markets. But you're right about the Bernie Sanders elections that – that, that definitely takes a little bit of, of off the table in terms of risk. Uh, you know, Biden is a more centric uh, uh, candidate, and that would be that would be a little bit of a, a takeoff risk. What do you uh, you know? You sound uh, very concerned about the coronavirus. Uh, you're here in the U.S., right, Tavi? Yes, I am in Denver, okay. Colorado. Right. What do, What are you doing to prepare for it with your family? Look, I'm not uh, doing anything. Uh, Did you go out and buy like a a, a whole pallet? full of toilet paper and bring it home? No, I, I did buy more than I usually <laughs> buy. Uh, my wife already always had a, a, a stock, stock of things like that. But yeah. uh, in terms of food, I did, I did intentionally buy more than I usually buy. I, bought, I eat a lot of rice, so I might as well just buy rice for, for the next yeah. year or so. I mean, it's, it really cost me not much to do that. Right. And I, um, so I did a little bit of that. Um, and... Uh, you know, I've been just reading, you know, about that doctors uh, of how to not get infected in, in terms of washing your hands and, and, yeah. uh, and taking vitamins and things like that. So I've, I've been taking care of that. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm scared. I think, I think it's a big deal. And I think, unfortunately, around my circle of friends, I'm not seeing this as a big deal. I think, I think it's a big deal for market participants. A lot of people have been sort of watching that more. Yeah. The people that are outside of the markets – they're not even talking about that. It's been sort of a joke, really. I mean, a lot of people have been joking about it when it sh really shouldn't be a joke. Uh, it's, well, it's I don't know. They're, uh, they're emptying out stores here at Costco. And so I think there is a little bit of panic beginning to set in. And um, have you heard my poem about coronavirus? No, I did not. And What's you could put it on your website uh, oh. or write a rap song. Okay. Corona, Corona. Fear that I'll own you. Born in a lab in China, spreading so I'll find you. Known as safe, not even a king, and I'll be the excuse for everything. Wow. Huh? Did you just do that? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> you like it? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> anyway, I don't know what I'm doing in the markets. So I no, should be a uh... <laughs> Nobel Poet Laureate. But uh, anyway, that uh, really the key line in that is it will be the excuse for everything. Yeah, I, I agree don't with you. Don't you think? I think I think it could be the uh, the thing that pops the entire bubble. I mean, it's there are so many reasons for why the bubble could be popping and it's it hasn't yet. I mean, it, you look at numbers – I suggest everyone to look at things like numbers in South Korea, Japan, and, uh, and even in the U.S. in terms of macro indicators. Prior to coronavirus, everything was turning lower, not higher. Look at the GDP number for the fourth quarter of Japan. Um, yeah. And by that, you can, you can only imagine how much would be the pain uh, economically speaking, this is the worst time that could that could ever happen. Yeah. But, and, and you know, let me let me validate that from last time you're on. Tavi, and I don't know how many months ago it was that <laughs> your narratives that are working now were already working before the coronavirus hit the headline. So uh, maybe this is just um, uh, a catalyst and uh, some type of a rocket booster for what was going to happen anyway. And again, this is just the excuse of what was going to happen anyway. 
what do you think? I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we looked at, we build a lot of macro indicators and macro models to help us to identify where we are in the cycle. And I, you know, believe strongly we're at the very peak of the cycle. It's exactly why uh, we like things like precious metals right now. And I, I think that it's, it's an interesting setup when you have precious metals being uh, so historically undervalued when you find stocks being so historically overvalued, it's what I call the, the, battle, the battle of extremes and really is. Um, and I think that the unwinding of that has just started. So, Okay. Well, Tavi, there you are. There's Tavi right on my screen. <laughs> uh, happy, great smile. You know, smiles, everything. And uh, you're my trading warrior brother, Tavi. And uh, I, you know, wish you a lot of success and, you that your family is safe and healthy and that you guys uh, can help people prosper during what may turn out to be a very serious crisis in terms of financial markets. So thank you for being with us again today, Tavi. Oh, thank you, coach. Same to you. And I, I hope, I hope you stay safe as well, obviously. And um, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for having me and for an invitation. I, I enjoy talking to you. All right. Well, uh, thank you for edifying us and some very interesting charts that you showed that silver ratio to stocks. And I didn't know that China was in negative yield territory. So you, I learned from you today, Tavi. Thank you, my <laughs> trading warrior brother. Thank you. Take care. All right, everyone. So that's a wrap for us. We'll see everyone tomorrow. Uh, good hunting the rest of the day. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. Hope everyone stays healthy and continues to trade and continues to be a warrior. Adios, everyone. Thank you, Tavi. Thank you.